This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Let's say there are two neighbors that drive the exact same distance every day. Maybe they work at the same place. One neighbor has a car that gets 25 miles per gallon, or 10.6 kilometers per liter. Then the other neighbor has a gas guzzler that only gets 8 miles per gallon. Now, one day they both decide to get a new, better car compared to their respective old ones, and the more fuel-efficient neighbor upgrades to a 35 mile per gallon car, while the other neighbor upgrades to just a 10 mile per gallon car. The question is, which neighbor's purchase is going to save more money on gas compared to their other car? And that's assuming they both pay the same amount per gallon or liter or whatever. We don't care about who's spending the least. That's obviously the top left car. We care about who will save more on gas or who will have a larger decrease in gallon slash liters used with respect to their older car for the same number of miles driven. Well, clearly the math here isn't hard, but this video is about intuition, and immediately we see that this neighbor's car clearly increased more numerically in just pure MPG fuel efficiency. It went up by 10 over 2. But let's look at percentages. Doing the math, we find this neighbor increased his fuel efficiency by 40%, while the other one increased his by only 25%. So actually, this guy does win in all aspects, but not really. Because yes, this is the neighbor that will save more on gas. And not just by a little. This person on the right will save over twice as much as the person on the left, regardless of how much they drive, assuming those distances are the same and not zero. Let's see the explanation though. We'll say they drive 1400 miles per month. That means this first car will use 56 gallons and the upgraded car will use 40, a savings of 16 gallons per month. Then assuming the same distance, the 8 mile per gallon car will use 175 gallons, while the 10 mile per gallon one will use 140, a savings of 35 gallons, which is yes, over twice as much saved compared to 16. The simple reason for this non-intuitive answer is to find gallons used, you have to take the miles you drive, whatever it is, I'll say X, and divide by your fuel efficiency, not multiply. So the numerical increase or percentage increase we found didn't tell us much. It's one over these values we care about. And when you take those differences or find the savings, you get a bigger number for the eight and 10 mile per gallon cars. Now this next question comes in different forms, but the idea is all the same. Let's say you have a strawberry that is 99% water by mass. The other 1% is other stuff. And let's say its total mass is 100 grams. Now we're going to remove just some of the water. Nothing else gets added or removed, such that the water now accounts for 98% of the new total mass. The question is, what is the new total mass? Well, based on the title of this video, you know it's probably not like 99 or 98 grams. Intuitively, those seem reasonable, but the surprising answer is that the new mass is 50 grams. So no, the water level you see here is not drawn to scale. Now the explanation here is more intuitive when we convert percentages into grams. So to begin, the water had a mass of 99 grams, which is 99% of 100. The other stuff was then just one gram. Now if we remove just one gram of water, the intuitive but wrong answer, you would then have 98 grams of water and 99 grams in total. In this scenario, the water does not account for 98% of the total, which is the requirement. So we have to keep removing more. If we remove 50 grams of water, then we'll have 49 grams left and 50 grams in total. Note the other stuff remains one gram this entire time. And now the water does account for 98% of the mass, 49 grams out of 50 total. So that's why this is the new total mass. Another way to interpret this is by noticing that the other stuff doesn't change in mass, but it doubles in percentage. And the only way that could happen is if the entire mass were halved. Now, if you look up counterintuitive math online, pretty much every resource is going to have this example, but we're going to go through it real quick. I really should have prepared for this better. Now, what we have here is a cable. And for the purpose of this question, this cable starts here and goes all the way around the earth back to here. 
So the length of this cable is exactly the circumference of the Earth. It's snug against it right now. Then what we're going to do is add an extension. Let's just say this is an extra six feet of cable. And then we're going to, again, wrap it around the Earth. But now, since there's a little extra, we can lift it a little bit above the ground all the way around. We can say there are like supports or people that will hold it, you know, above the Earth as we wrap it around again. So the question is, how high off the Earth's surface will this be once evenly distributed all the way around again? Or basically, what's the new radius going to be? Well, the math here isn't that hard, but a lot of people's intuition would probably be wrong. Because a lot of people will say, well, we only have six feet extra of cable, and we got to wrap that around 40,000 kilometers that is Earth's circumference. So we probably couldn't even get that more than a few micrometers or even nanometers above the surface if we're evenly distributing it all the way around. But that's not how circumferences work, because it turns out we can lift it just under a foot, again, all the way around the Earth. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Without the extension, we have the length or circumference is 2 pi times the radius of the Earth. Once we add the extension, we now have added to the circumference. We've added 6 to it, so we've got to add 6 to both sides of this equation. And then what we're going to do is factor out a 2 pi from the right side. So we get essentially the new circumference is 2 pi times the old radius of Earth plus 6 over 2 pi. And 6 over 2 pi is just about 0.95. So now we have new circumference equals 2 pi times the new radius, or the radius of Earth, plus an extra 0.95 feet above the surface. So really, if you add any extension to this, you just divide that by 2 pi, and that's how much higher you could lift this above the Earth all the way around. Now, okay, that was a pretty simple example, but this next one won't be. Let's say you get to the casino, and they have a new game. It's not a really fun game, but here's how it works. All that happens is the dealer starts turning over cards face up, one at a time, and all you have to do is correctly guess at which position will the fourth and final ace show up. So you could say, oh, it's going to be in the 25th spot or the 38th spot or whatever. And we'll assume the deck is shuffled in a completely random way, so no strategy there. Now, since everything is random, it seems like there's going to be no strategy in general. I mean, all the aces could show up at any position. But there's actually one best answer here, one spot to pick that will optimize the probability every single time. And we're, we're assuming the payout's the same for every spot. And that is the last spot. Guessing that the final ace will be in the 52nd position will guarantee you will win this every single time. No, I'm kidding. But you will win more often than if you had picked any other number. So why is that the case? Well, first let's realize there are stupid answers in this game. For example, saying the first card is going to be the fourth ace is a bad answer. Even if it is an ace, it can't be the fourth one. Same with the second and the third. The fourth card could be the fourth ace, and same with everything through 52. So those are all reasonable guesses. However, by guessing that the 52nd card is the final ace, you're guaranteeing that if an ace does show up in that position, it's definitely the last ace. Because if you guess position like 38 holds the final ace, then even if an ace does show up there, it could be the last, or it could be the first, second, or third. So the last position at least guarantees that it would be the final ace. Now, let's take this down to a deck of six cards instead of 52, just to simplify things. Because the general idea of why you want to guess the last card, or just in general further down the line, is because there are more permutations that exist with that card being the fourth and final ace. Simple as that. There are a finite number of permutations that exist. We want the most having your guess as the last ace. For example, if you guess the fourth card holds the fourth and final ace, the only way that can happen is if all four aces show up, then the other cards. That's it. Yes, you can rearrange these however you want, so it's not just one permutation. Here's, that's a winner too. That's a winner. That's a winner. There are 24 permutations of these four cards, and then you also got rearranging these cards for every permutation. So there are many ways you can win by guessing that's the final ace. But if you guess the fifth card is the final ace, there are now more permutations. Because you can do the same rearranging of the aces, right? Like this, this is a winner, that's a winner, that's a winner, same with this. You can rearrange the four aces, ignore these, you can rearrange these 
24 ways. Rearrange these two ways with those same 24. But now there's even more like this. That's a winner. That's a winner. That's a winner. You can switch the queens. There are more permutations where you win if you pick that as the final ace. And if you go to the sixth one, the same thing happens. Again, 24 ways I could rearrange these aces. But now I can move the queens around even more. This is a winner. This is a winner. This is a winner. This is a winner. Everything, all of these, winners. So the further down the line you guess, the more permutations there are where you're going to win. And I don't want to go into the detailed math with 52 cards, but if you imagine a deck with only three cards, let's say two aces and one king, then there are six permutations there. And if you were to guess that the third spot holds the final ace, the second one in this case, you would win four out of the six times. If you guess the second spot holds the final ace, you'll only win two out of six times. And if you guess the first spot, you'll win zero out of six times. So again, guessing the final card holds the last ace is going to optimize your odds of winning. Okay, now all the examples you've seen here have been fun math questions and puzzles, but the thing to realize is that math and numbers in general can be counterintuitive. And this doesn't just show up in videos like this, but on social media and in the news all the time. We're often given numbers that aren't necessarily wrong, but the way we interpret them doesn't reflect the reality of the situation. And I've done videos on this, there have been books written on this, and people have gone to jail based on the misuse of numbers, stats, and data. One of my favorite, less serious examples that I talked about in another video, but I'll highlight real quick, is when a governor of Wisconsin boasted that over 50% of net job growth happened in Wisconsin for a given quarter. And it seemed like that was true. Because what happened was the net job growth in the United States was like 18,000, and in Wisconsin it was 9,500, so over 50%, right? But there was a huge flaw in that reasoning. To see why, just imagine a country with four states, A, B, C, and D, and we'll say in state A there was a net loss of 1,000 jobs, in state B there was a net gain of 1,000 jobs, and in state C and D there was a net gain of 500 jobs each. Now, the net job growth in that country for the year would be 1,000 jobs. So then state C, just like with Wisconsin, could say, oh look, net job growth was 1,000, our state had a growth of 500, therefore 50% of net job growth happened in our state alone. And state D could say the same thing. But then state B could say, well, 100% of job growth happened in our state, 1,000 out of 1,000. And these numbers clearly make no sense. They add to more than 100%. So it turns out you can't use percentages like this when you can have negative numbers, or job losses in this case, because, yes, they make no sense. And that's what happened with the governor of Wisconsin. I'll link those videos down below, but in general, just realize it's not always the blatant lies we have to look out for. I mean, we definitely still should, but often it's instead the misleading truths. Where the data presented isn't necessarily wrong, but the way it will be interpreted is. Again, I could talk about this for a while, and likely we'll have more videos on it, but for now, if you want to continue learning about the world and universe around us, then I recommend checking out CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video. We've seen how easy it is for everyday people to make mistakes, but even the smartest people in history have, and one documentary I really enjoyed was The Hawking Paradox that covers one of the biggest mistakes made by Stephen Hawking in his quest to understand the physics behind black holes. I've always found these interesting, and this documentary goes through the question of whether information is lost when it goes into a black hole, how parallel universes play a part in understanding black holes, and much more. And if physics isn't for you, CuriosityStream has documentaries on technology, engineering, crime and forensics, history, and much more that'll help you get to know the world and universe around us just a little more. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. Then if you go to curiositystream.com slash zackstar or click the link below and use the promo code zackstar, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in just giving it a try. And with this, you'll have unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.